hello everybody and welcome to the Surge Podcast. Uh, so for today's episode, and I'm sort of going to be talking about something that's a little bit off topic, but I think is going to be an extremely important part of our practice. Um, I'm going to be talking about cybersecurity and healthcare <clears throat> and how we have to be better at it collectively as a group of healthcare professionals. Um, I think, you know, it's one of those things that's going to be quite prevalent uh, in our practice, whether you're doing surgery or medicine or radiology, obviously, because they use a lot of computers. And while I was researching the topic, I realized that there's no way that I can give it the way that I want to and do it justice on my own. So um, if anybody's willing to volunteer and help me out, uh, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, On both the cybersecurity front, uh, pen testing, ComSec, uh, OSINT, and on the other side of things, uh, on the healthcare front. And the reason why I'm asking for this is because having talked to some people who are experts in the field while researching this, I realized how completely ignorant we all are. Now, it, it's it's a bit of an issue, right? And and it's this story, I think, w- will, will illustrate that point to an extent. Um, so right off the bat, this story starts off with uh, the issue of mental health and the stigma of mental health. And, you know, imagine uh, being somebody who uh, has had issues uh, for a while, uh, depression, uh, etc., maybe some substance abuse, maybe nothing quite that sinister, but in your particular field of work, um, it's looked down upon or it's felt to be inappropriate to have mental support. And you finally end up uh, getting the courage uh, and the support system uh, to just end up doing the right thing and seeking mental help. And your psychiatrist is part of this major, major company, and this company has really done a lot of good. And you've, you've struggled and you've gone against multiple odds to engage with your psychiatrist and, and to build the trust that was required. And and, you know, it took you quite a long time to get there. And, and it wasn't an easy thing for you, certainly. And it's always commendable when you reach that point. For anybody who's been through it or knows somebody who's been through it, you know how difficult this is. And you know how, how a support system counts for something. And you know how intimate these sessions can be with your psychiatrist and your psychologist and your mental health specialist. And how demanding emotionally it can be for you and for that mental health specialist, as well as your family as you adjust. And obviously, back in the day, we used to keep these records in our heads and write some notes down. But increasingly, modern mental health care specialists and modern health care in general have relied on computers and passwords to do this. This has been an absolute boon for multiple reasons, including research. Uh, record keeping, accounting, billing, statistics, prediction models, even safety of patients to an extent. However, unfortunately, imagine if you woke up the next morning after your last psychiatric session or last mental health consultation, let's say, and you got an email asking you for 200 euros or somebody will release all of your records to the public. And every single little secret that you talked about, things that your ex might not know, things that your current girlfriend or boyfriend might not know, things that your current partner would not want to know and you wouldn't want them to know about your past, things that your employers or employees should not know, things that you can even get blackmailed with. Imagine if all that information landed in public. We're still, imagine getting an email asking you to pay 200 euros or they'll land it in public. This is what happened to the patients of the Vastamo Clinic. The reality of the situation is, when I read this, I was mortified. A hacker hacked into that clinic, produced 40,000 records, and began to email individual patients, blackmailing them. Now you ask, why would they email the patients and not the company themselves? This is a copy of the email in Finnish, by the way. This is a clinic in Finland. Um, I originally saw this on uh, Politico, and I was mortified at first. You know, initially they said about tens of thousands, and then it turned out to be 40,000, right? But then I I wanted to know how could we as a healthcare community allow this to happen? And how do you fix it? Like, 
it, it may have been the trauma surgeon in me, but I was like, well, this is a disaster. This is horrible. Patients who could be suicidal are being blackmailed. And they're being blackmailed in a horrible, horrible way over extremely intimate details, right? And, and these are transcripts. Uh, these are, because it's a fully digitized system, right? So it's voice notes that are converted. So these are transcripts. These are notes. These are records. These are toxicology screens. A massive, massive hack. And I was mortified initially, but then I, I got to thinking, how can we prevent this? And how did this actually happen? And why would he target patients? And patients' families, and and how could this stuff exist on the internet, right? And I'm not completely ignorant, but it, it takes a lot of work for somebody to send out en masse a whole bunch of emails asking for individuals to pay them Bitcoin. And you wouldn't get there from the start. This isn't an idea that started off right off the bat at that level. And so I dug a little bit deeper and I looked at a couple of Finnish resources using Google Translate and things like that and dug into the sort of the Tor community or the Onion Router community, the dark web, uh, underweb, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I saw a couple of interesting things that I think are both scary but also extremely important to acknowledge it. as people who use these systems on a daily basis. Remember, we're the end users, right? So apparently, initially, they had reached to the uh, CEO of the actual company, Vastamo, the, the hacker group or the hacker himself. He called himself Ransom Man. He'd reached out to them. And at the time, they had refused to pay anything. And the money that they had asked for was about, I think it was uh, 40 Bitcoin or something. Now, this is a huge company in Finland that deals with uh, a lot like a chain of psychiatric and mental health support services, right? And when they had originally refused to pay that sum, which is a knee-jerk reaction, I, I don't know, like if I was blackmailed and I, as a CEO and I did not have any proof that you had these files, I don't know if I would have paid or not. I, I can't judge that. I don't, I don't know what the original email looked like or what the original dialogue was, whether it was over the phone or not, whether it was in Finnish or English, whether there was a threatening response or not. But once the CEO had ignored that person, what ended up happening was the hacker released a hundred records. Now, at that point, I would have taken it a little bit more seriously. I may have even considered paying them off if I had enough money for it as the CEO, because my first duty is to protect my patients. And that might be one thing that I do. But then again, you'll say, uh, once a blackmailer or was a blackmailer, he'll ask for 40 now, another 80 later. I would have at least alerted the police at that point. And apparently that didn't happen. So the hacker released another hundred and then another 100 for a total of 300 records. A total of 10 gigabytes of patient data apparently was put online. And the blackmailer said that he has, or they have as a group, hacked into four other organizations, right? Um, so some of them which aren't Finnish, right? Some of them aren't local. So this is an international threat now, right? And some of them aren't even healthcare. And during the exchange with the extortionists, apparently the, the part of the negotiation that was had with Vastamo was that Vastamo was telling him that he could push the patients towards suicide, which is true if you're right on the edge. And apparently the hacker's response, and I could only corroborate this from one site, which I've included. It was from uh, the Bitdefender blog. Apparently the hacker once told that you know you could lead to patients potentially dying committing suicide or attempting to commit suicide the response was he doesn't care uh, if the therapy leaks drive a patient towards th suicide now this was on there but having looked a little bit deeper the dialogue probably was a little bit more like if you don't care enough to pay me i don't care enough to take these offline but then again i'm going to ask you how the hell did this happen like, I could understand a leak of 10 records, 15 records, maybe. But for 10 gigabytes of data to be just scratching the surface, 10 gigabytes of data, is, is a bit too much, right? And, and you know, a quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm at best a script kitty at this point. I do not understand uh, ComSec, healthcare sec, pen testing very well. I do understand certain concepts. And if you were to show me a YouTube video, I'd know what was going on. If I watched an episode of Mr. Robot, I'd kind of get what was going on. But in general, 
everything that I'm going to talk about in terms of techniques used and things like that, of how this could have potentially happened, is going to be theoretical. And before we even get there, I really, really, again, want to emphasize, I really want to understand, how could somebody come up with this idea to blackmail individual patients? Right? And what are the specifics of this case? And apparently, this whole thing started initially with this forum post, literally. This was the first forum post that came up on the dark web, asking for 40 bitcoins, and then divulging the first set of patient data. Right? After that post, in about 24 hours, somebody came up and said, how much do I have to pay you for you to delete that information? my information. So that's probably somebody was on the initial release here who didn't want their information to be available. And the hacker said 0 0.05 Bitcoin, which is about 300 euros. And slowly but surely, if you look at the hacker's wallet that he put up in this original post, you can see that within that wallet, there were multiple deposits over the next 24 hours between the 22nd when this discussion happened and the 23rd which meant that other people were involved for various different sums. And then these emails started to come out on the 24th of October. So now we have a timeline. We have an idea of what motivated him. Basically, it was somebody suggesting it. So initially divulging initial data after talking to the CEO directly to prove that he actually has this information. This guy who calls himself Ransom Man, right? And then asking somebody randomly asking him if they can take their data offline and him responding yep i can do that for you for this much money in bitcoin which is not traceable and then the wallet getting sequential amounts of bitcoin gradually and then the emails start happening with links to the actual patient files individual patient files that's when things started to happen so it was a gradual thing somebody gave him the idea and now you know it's not justifiable by any means but at least now I find it a little bit less disturbing in that it wasn't a knee-jerk response to just go and email patients and tell them I'm going to divulge things. But the hacker took it a little bit further. And I think, you know, he was starting to get a little bit, you know, more and more targeted by putting up certain police emails of the patients. So certain patients who had police emails, Finnish police emails, had their emails divulged with some of their data. And that's extremely disturbing and inappropriate because there could be some stigma there. I know certainly that certain police forces around the world, mental health becomes a stigma. And, and you know, I don't blame any police officer after what they go through. They protect us on a daily basis. They see things that even me as a trauma surgeon probably won't see. But to do that is another line that's crossed, right? And when you look at the number of calls that the police got during that time period, it went through the roof. A total of 25,000 reports are directly related to the hacking of the Vastoma Clinic Group. 25,000. There were so many people depositing money to get their information taken off that there was a spike in cryptocurrency transactions related to scam activity in Finland. Typically, the United States and Russia are the main countries involved in scams of this nature simply because of their size. But Finland had a spike on October 25th. This tells you how significant this is. How significant this one single hack was. And how much it affected people. And so, looking at it as a healthcare worker, I think that this has made me far more vigilant and far more scared of using certain types of computer equipment. And I don't have any straight answers for containment and a solution. Because, let's face it, how many of you were taught this in medical school? Residency. How many of you had any of the stuff brought up at conferences that you go to? Not conferences that your IT department goes to, right? And you're going to say, well, what's the containment and solution to the problem? Whose fault is it? Things like that. And I would contend prevention and safeguards are key. And one of the things is I couldn't get a lot of information on the IT infrastructure yet. Um, I do know that based on Wikipedia, they say that the company's security practices were found at some point to be inadequate. And that, in fact, the original leak happened in 2018, 
And there was a second leak that happened in 2019. And that one of the inadequacies was the fact that the, the sensitive data was not encrypted. I doubt many of you know how to encrypt your hard disks or your phones. You rely on Apple to do it for you or Android or something like that or Samsung. Number two, that the system root passwords, so the system administrative passwords, the passwords that you're not even allowed to have access to on your Mac, even as admin. These are passwords that can do whatever they want. They, they, these are usernames. The root username can access any permission set in your Mac or any permission set in any Unix or Linux system. And before you tell me that a Mac isn't hackable, you know, take a deep breath and do a Google search, all right? You'll be shocked. So to go back to on point, so this whole problem didn't start in 2020, in October 2020. This problem started in November 2018. And if any safeguards should have been put in place, they should have been put in place in 2018. And you're going to ask me, well, why did the uh, threat actor or why did the hacker wait this long? Why did this ransom man guy wait this long? Well, the answer is pretty simple if you know anything about computers. Typically, most IT infrastructure, so most information technology companies, most of us who use computers on a regular basis will not keep logs for more than two years. After two years, you tend to erase the old logs. Maximum. Typically. Now, this, there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, banking systems tend to keep them a little bit longer in certain jurisdictions uh, where it's required. Uh, some banking systems have a more robust backup system. But to be honest with you, most companies that work in healthcare will not keep logs, individual logs of logins and logouts who access the system for more than two years. And so the, the threat actor was probably waiting for that time period to expire. And you're going to say, well, they're not HIPAA compliant because it's Europe. Well, guess what? European agencies have an even more stringent criteria than HIPAA does. Right? And and you really have to think that, that both HIPAA and European agencies that, that involve themselves with regulation of healthcare worker software, both both consortia or both sets of, of, of regulations and, and laws are centered around a different thought process. They're centered around protecting patient confidentiality from being published outside. They're not centered around developing secure networks for the transfer of patient data. And when you ask me whose fault it is, and some of you will say it's the IT guy's fault. Well, my answer is yes, to an extent, but no, to another extent. So if you look at other sectors like the banking sector, or if you look at uh, certain research sectors, um, it's not the IT person's fault or their responsibility alone. It is a shared responsibility. Much like in healthcare, we have a shared responsibility towards our patients, between our nursing staff and our physiotherapists, there is a shared responsibility between the people who work within a hospital system that require hospital software. And ultimately, in this particular case, uh, Vastamo fired the CEO because he knew about the original data breach in 2018 and failed to act upon it. Right. And, you know, some of us are going to go, good, that's exactly the right thing to do. And I say that 100 percent. I think that if you knew about a data breach and you didn't address it and you didn't divulge it, no matter what sector you're in, you are to be held liable as the CEO. The buck stops with you. If you knew about it and you didn't do anything about it, it's your problem. Now, I looked into the fine print of this and, you know, it's Google translated. And I can't tell you exactly what the specific things are. But he, he apparently knew about it earlier, and apparently it was sort of felt to be smaller than they had predicted. It was felt to be like a couple of hundred patients. That is not an excuse. If a hundred patients, including police officers, lawyers, doctors, got their data put up online, and that data could reduce their ability to be employed, could be used to blackmail them, could be used to end relationships with them, it's unacceptable in my opinion. So in the end, don't expect HEPA to help you. HEPA only takes into account a very small part of the equation. And I've looked around a lot, a lot, and a lot, and the best source that I could find for what happened or what possibly could have happened was that there was a hacking into the reception room that shocked the whole society from one of the newly appointed chairmen's in a press release. And this is obviously a Google Translate of another Google Translate. But let's take that hypothetical. And let's only call it a hypothetical because I don't know exactly how this happened yet. 
Let's take that as the hypothetical. Don't think that that will only happen there. It has happened in the United States. And in fact, in the United States, the correct action was taken and that the issue was divulged. And this had happened to at the Center uh, for Facial Reconstruction. And you can look it up yourselves, but it's uh, in Miramar, Florida. And they had actually divulged it in a very clear and transparent way. And they had come up with a plan to clean up everything. And they had said that the clinic servers were in fact penetrated and that 15 to 20 patients had contacted them and had been contacted and blackmailed. This was a plastic surgery clinic. I would argue that it holds the same stigma as mental health. Imagine if people knew that, that you had plastic surgery, that your, your face isn't really your face or something of that nature. Not that it's not really your face, but that you had had to have modifications done. How would you feel about it when, when you had, you'd, had always felt that it was a bad part of you? Like, it's always disturbing when these things happen. And this happened in the States. So this happened in a country with HIPAA. So you can't make the argument that HIPAA is the main thing, right? In this particular case, they changed out their whole IT infrastructure, and they go into great detail on it. And I think that it's very admirable what they did at the Richard E. Davis practice. I think that it's the right thing to do to divulge things, to report it to the relevant authorities as opposed to just ignoring it for a year and a half until 40,000 patients end up having their records in the wrong hands. And that's another thing that, that I think is very important to understand. The minute something is put up online, people can download it. For every download, you have an extra copy that may resurface later down the line. And that's another big problem in healthcare. And one of the key things that I think we should really talk about is in other industries, such as banking, economics, security industries, uh, even pharmaceutical companies, right? Like people outside of frontline or what I would say patient interactive healthcare that rely on healthcare information systems. There is a typical blue team and they're responsible for what you would say is the IT guy's fault. So things like defensive security, setting up firewalls, restricting your internet access, infrastructure protection, damage control when something goes wrong, an incident response for when, for when something goes offline. The security of your network and maintenance of passwords and expiring passwords, etc. And looking for possible threats, as well as chasing after threats and seeing what happens, right? But they also have specific dedicated companies that do what we call penetration testing, which is breaking into systems, actively trying to get into a system in a very ethical way, to expose its vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities that you may not think of if you spent your whole life building healthcare information systems. And these are people that do offensive security, ethical hacking, find vulnerabilities to exploit, including human factor vulnerabilities, penetration testing, black box te testing. So testing in a way that's not very clear. Using social cues and social engineering, web app scanning, right? And you need to have both aspects within your plan for the development of your healthcare information system, in my humble opinion, to keep patients safe. And these are things that I was never taught. Like, I went down this rabbit hole only because three weeks ago, I was shocked by what I read about Vastamo. And the more I read, the more I was intrigued. Like, I think that this is a part of our practice that we should be very, 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 very interested in. You don't have to be an IT guy. But you have to be very honest. How many of you know enough to be able to know when there's something wrong with your IT infrastructure? Even now, to this day, online, there are people surfacing, looking at Vastamo's uh, servers and finding that their servers have been outdated for up to five years, right? Even right now, after the threat, how many of you check for these things? How many of the CEOs listening to this check for these things? And don't ask yourself how this could happen, but ask yourself why it happened. That's the more important question. Most, like most of the people I talk to work in information technology security or computer security or cybersecurity while preparing this talk, they, the way that they explained it to me was extremely humbling because they weren't too technical with me. And yet they showed me that I was never prepared to use the software that we're using. I was never prepared to be able to keep things safe. And, and I was never taught how to do it because all my life, the most that I'd ever learned was that this is what a healthcare information system looks like, right? 
you have appointment management, you have patient registration, you have lab management, you have medical information management, PAC systems, etc. You have user management for access, you have staff management. Sometimes you'll have a couple more adjuncts like stock control or pharmacy management or e-pharmacy selection and delivery. But we don't have a holistic infrastructure for this in general. We have all these things linked together through bridges, and all those bridges can be exposed to vulnerabilities. But by far, the biggest vulnerability is when that bridge interacts with the health science professionals. And when those health science professionals take information from that background healthcare information system and use it for other things and store it locally, that's another huge vulnerability. Because no matter how good your IT guy is, he can't control what you're doing with your own device. Now, be honest, how many of you have written papers using data from hundreds to thousands of patients where you've done the statistics on your computer that's connected online, and that's your personal computer? How many of you have worked on presentations at home and have had pictures of patients on there, and the presentations are still on the same laptop that's online right now while you're listening to this podcast? And it gets worse still. A lot of your patients in the future will interact directly with your HIS systems. They will be interacting directly with them. They will be sending data directly to the HIS system, and you will be accessing that data. In fact, in this particular case, part of their system was that patients would fill in a form online, right? And that is another source potentially for you, right? If you have an online booking system for your practice, you'd better hope that that thing is not linked to your actual HIS system, that there's some sort of bridge. How many of you use your work email to register for something else, like PayPal or Amazon? Right? How many of us do that regularly? How many of us actually change our passwords regularly? And how many of us have separate laptops and devices for work and for home? Let's be very honest here. You have access to your computer systems once or twice, your EHR once or twice, if you're lucky enough to do that at 4 a.m. just to check a chest x-ray that the resident was worried about. Think about that, right? And think about how easy it is for patient data on the laptop right now from the last paper that you wrote or the last bit of statistics that you did or the last quality control project that you did or your master's thesis that contains actual patient data. Yes, it is anonymized. But anybody who works in IT can tell you there's nothing called anonymized data. No matter how much you anonymize it, it takes two or three data points for them to figure out who that person is. Typically, we all use very similar usernames, even if we don't want to. The corporate world will take your first name or your last name or your last name or your first name and slap on an at and then the domain name of your, your, your hospital system, right? We also tend to use similar passwords because of the password restrictions. They're always going to be between six and eight characters. There's going to be some special characters, but you're never going to remember a password that's over 12 characters. It's extremely rare, unless you use a couple of other tricks, right? And we tend to use the same devices and, in fact, the same apps. So if you use Outlook, use Outlook for everything. If you use Gmail, use Gmail for everything. And that might not be a good idea either, all right? In fact, I would contend, if you go on to haveibeenpwned.com, listed right here, I'm going to try and include in the show notes, and you put in your email address or any one of your email addresses, at least one in five of us will probably have suffered from a breach, a data breach, where our email was leaked with our name and possibly our password or an encrypted version of our password or what's called a hashed version, an obscured version of our password, right, that can easily be used, okay? I think that this is the best website to start with to make sure that there's nothing wrong with your accounts, by the way. And remember, our job as physicians to protect our patients from such threats, not just physicians, but healthcare workers in general, is to educate ourselves. Because you are the end user. You're the vulnerability in the system. No matter how good your IT guy is, it could be an extra from Mr. Robot, right? But no matter, it could be Neo from the Matrix dealing with this part of it. But so long as it's interacting with you and patients and we're not educated enough, there's going to be a problem. You have to educate yourself. What I've been told to do typically is I use different email apps for different accounts. My work account does not interact with my actual daily driver account, which doesn't interact with my podcast account. 
I use three different apps. I use a different PC that's air gapped. Air gapping is when it's not connected to the internet for any statistical calculations that I'm doing or any patient data man manipulation. I oftentimes introduce it to that machine through a USB. I do not access anything remotely. I try my best not to, okay? If it's important enough for me to check, I'd rather be in house anyway, to be honest with you. If I can't get to my PC, for example, I'm traveling and I have to work on statistics, I use a virtual machine, which I'll get into later, possibly in another episode, if you guys like this type of thing. And what a virtual machine is, is that it's a uh, emulated operating system on top of another operating system. And I tend to use a Linux-based operating system called BioLinux because I use R for statistical computing, and it works out great for me. I never keep my LinkedIn up to date. My LinkedIn is at least a couple of years old. Nobody knows where I'm working right now, effectively. Like they know ballpark, I'm in the Middle East, maybe in Qatar one week, maybe in Kuwait the other, but nobody knows exactly where I'm working long term, right? And I never use my work email for anything that I do online. I never register it for anything, including journals. I use my Gmail and I say that that's my email. If they accept it, they accept it. And if they don't, then I try to explain to them why. That it's a security risk to use that email. Because that email is what's going to gain access to the local infrastructure at that hospital and my patient data. And in a theoretical narrative, if you were to say, how do these guys, how do these hackers get into it? It's not a matrix thing. It's not like they have a neon green computer. Well, it might, might be neon green, I don't know. And they type into it. My understanding, and it's my humble understanding, and please, if you're listening to this and you're a hacker, do not hack into anything that's mine. Please, please, I'm begging you. I don't know anything about this stuff. I just figured it out this week, to be honest. Okay? There's a lot of intelligence gathering in the beginning. They try and figure out who works where and what their job is, and who can gain them access to the system. Then there's a little bit of social engineering. Social engineering is when you create a, a fake narrative or a fake story that will give you access. Then there's a the technical aspect, which is the computer security aspect, right? Which is looking at the software and where the software is vulnerable and will allow them to gain access. So when you talk about intelligence or OSINT, OSINT is open source intelligence. It's intelligence that's available online. The easiest way to do that is to create a fake email. I'm not saying that anybody should do this. I'm just giving you a theoretical narrative and example. You will get caught. This is oversimplified. And if you do it from a computer directly without any sort of like anti-tracing measures, let's say, you are going to get caught. So I wouldn't recommend that anybody does this. They create a fake email account, then a fake link LinkedIn. And then they look up at least one person in that company who has a company email address. Then they use that to look up other people in that company and they check if that same email has been used on other services such as PayPal. Now, there is a way to check that. It's a very intricate way. I'm not going to get into it so that uh, I don't get accused of teaching people to do something illegal. But you can check if, say, somebody's registered for MSN or Amazon or uh, you know Netflix or something like that or Fiverr or, or those those come or LinkedIn or those companies, right? And once they check if that email is listed, they also check on other websites to see if there's been a breach before on that domain. And that's where they start. And so then they have a list of people with a list of services that they've already signed up for. And they can create the perfect fake email that they know that the target is going to have to answer to. An example would be if that target has a previously been in a breach for a certain bank, then you would create an email for that bank because you know that that person has that account. And you would say, um, set up an identical website to that. And all they have to do is click on that website to open up a piece of software that will allow them to breach. And then you deploy that email. And that's where the technical computer security aspect comes in, where they may fashion a malware that's linked to that target website. Sometimes it's as simple as a word macro, something that any of us can do. We can all make word macros. They're very easy to do, and they're actually very useful if you do a lot of publishing, right? And in this case, or in certain cases, it might have remote control of a certain computer on the network, the computer where it was clicked, or it may allow for automatic file transfer if they know what files they want, right? And it may actually allow you to jump to other workstations on the network and other computers on the network. And so that intricate thing where, number one, they send out an email, the victim clicks on the email, it opens up what's called a phishing website. And this method is called phishing. And by far, this is apparently the most this is the most 
common method that's used. And from that phishing email, the attacker can get credentials for which he can log into the legitimate website, your legitimate IT infrastructure, okay? And this is just an example for PayPal that I found online, and it looks almost the same. Yes, the logo looks a little bit different, but if you were half asleep and it was 5.51 a.m. and you got this email, you're going to click it now. And when you click it now, it's going to deploy something on your phone, deploy something on your Mac, deploy something on your PC, deploy something on your workstation, and try and grab as much credentials as it can. Never use your work email for anything other than work for this particular reason. If you only use your e work email for work, and you get this funny looking email, and you know that your PayPal is not linked to your work email, then you know for a fact that you're a target. And you can actually send that to your IT guys, right? Passwords, change them as regularly as you can. I use a password manager now, I'm not gonna divulge which one, but I use a password manager now because it allows me to have longer passwords that are more complicated. And check for breaches on have I been, have I been pwned regularly. Right? There's even a service where you can subscribe and it will alert you if you've been breached. And I think, you know, I personally think companies should sign up with the person who made this website to have all of their emails checked regularly and to get reports. I think that if you work in healthcare IT, this website is a boon. And I also think that there should be some restrictions on how you can use your work email. Right? So where do we go from here? Should there be a better consensus? Did you find this in any way useful? I'm sure that some of it probably went over some people's heads if you're not regularly working in IT. But, you know, I felt the same way when this was explained to me. Do you think that there should be an editorial on this in some journal? Are you an editor of a journal and would like me or somebody else to write an editorial on this and how it affects patients and how it affects healthcare and how it's a genuine worthwhile investment educating ourselves during our residency on this stuff? during the first month at work on this stuff? Should this be at conferences? Would you like to see more things like this? Would you like to see things about how some hackers are trying to hack into CT scanners? Or how there are major legal implications about this? Let me know your thoughts. This is Saud Al-Zaid, and thank you for listening. And please subscribe, like, and comment. Um, your support means a lot.